Thank you, Tom. I'm also a colleague of Tom's at the University of Minnesota. I live in Denver, but uh, commute out there twice a month. Um, to begin, I just want to say thank you to Esri and in particular Shannon for inviting me. And yesterday we were challenged to ponder, you know, why we're here. Um, so I really did. Um, because I really don't work in the world of uh, uh, GIS that much. Um, but what I'm here to learn is interactive or interdisciplinary design from all the perspectives here and, and to try and contribute a unique or a different perspective to this uh, interdisciplinary stew of geodesign uh, discussion. Uh, I would like to start out with a, a, a real basic assumption or something that's obvious, that I do like consistencies. Uh, yesterday we heard that the world is or, uh, inconsistent or uncertain. So I do like certainties. Everybody does. I'm an engineer. I love this concrete wall. I love that know that there's building codes, that this, co this, this building is not going to fall down. I love to know that my jet tonight is going to land in Denver safely. That certainties are definitely important. But a non sequitur to that might be that I also think we need to embrace uncertainties. So if the world is uncertain, we don't want to pound a round peg into a square hole all the time because uncertainty is where innovation comes from, right? I mean, if we're always certain of our outcomes and nothing new happens, that's literally the definition of innovation, that something new has to come out of it. And uncertainties is that world. And for me, that's the world of non sequitur thought. So actually, Joe uh, keyed this up very well. All these things that we just do without really questioning, that doesn't make sense, it's illogical. The world of non sequiturs is here in the United States as well as the developing world. I'm going to focus on the developing world for the contrast, though, um, and also talk about, in a similar vein, constraints. Because we've heard in this conference, and you walk around, and you know that the average American eco footprint is five globes, and we just say that, and then we design without constraints. So there's a reason why we are consuming five globes, because we are not constrained in our design. Generally, planners and designers don't like that term. Um, but I'm going to say that um, developed or the developing world is experiencing this, has to design with constraints, and there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the developing world. So to kick it off, um, again, I like um, certainties. I love standards and metrics. But as Joe said, again, that um, every city has a soul, and if you believe in that, how do you quantify one city to another? And why do we have to take everything and just look at apples to apples and not, how do you quantify the differences? And so when we lead with metrics, we're often um, ignoring these uh, uncertainties and uh, things that stare us in the face. So this just came out this past June from ISO 37120. I'm going to pick on it a little bit because it's an international standard and makes this bold statement that stuck out, uh, you know, came out to me right away is that this standard is applicable to any city that undertakes to measure its performance in a comparable and ver verifiable manner, irrespective of size and location. And there's a huge variety of cities around the world, a large different number of souls, and every city um, approaches sustainable design differently. So I, my perspective, again, is an engineer that looks at infrastructure from the social, cultural context. And when you talk about sustainable development, you have to understand that you need to start with a stable community. And there's a lot of reasons why communities are stable. And in the developed world, we don't think about infrastructure that much, but it's incredibly important for the rest of the world. And so I want to point out a couple of things. That, um, from an engineering perspective, you might have this as a view of transportation. This is not California traffic. It's not even Colorado. It's a dream sequence of... Um, Everybody getting to work efficiently, uh, Laplace equation working out for the engineer. Um, this is transportation engineering. What happens when we take the same equations and plop it anywhere in the world? Um, if you plop it in Ahmedabad, India, this is not an irregular thing. This, is, this cow is um, not going anywhere. <laughs> There's nobody kicking that cow away. They just simply have to get around it. What happens when you add a cargo elephant to your Laplace equation? <laughs> or a random Ganesha demonstration? That's not permitted. It just happens. But that's why we travel, right? 
for people that like to travel, you like these differences. These are visible, what I call visible non sequiturs in design. So this is affecting my engineering. It's affecting my Laplace equation, and this is very visible. And I call it visible because the majority of what I call non sequiturs in cultural and social design are not visible. There are expectations that we don't know of. So I might logically think of one way and the clients or the stakeholders and community view something completely different. To me, that's a non sequitur. So I also like uh, Donella Meadows, so I have a couple uh, quotes from her, but I also want to point out that she uses the term physical structure in a very obvious statement. So it ends with, the leverage point is proper design in the first place. Of course it makes sense. But for me, physical structure is a point of contention because it, we're not on the same page on this discussion because engineers use the term infrastructure. And yesterday I heard the term socio-technical, and that's how I refer to it. And I think planners and designers are very comfortable with saying socio-technical because that's why you plan and design. You want to move people efficiently, and you're thinking about the flow and behavior of people, and the infrastructure provides that. Then you hand the design to an engineer, and he or she views it as a physical structure. So if we're all on the same page, if this is an interdisciplinary design um, charrette, geodesign, then we all have to start from the same common view of what infrastructure is. And so I do agree that infrastructure is a socio-technical system. So for example, this is uh, just last summer again, this is an NPR news story. Is this something an engineer should go talk to her about? Is this a social issue? Is it a policy issue? Yes, it's all the above. So what does it look like when basic services are not delivered? And, and this is mega cities. This is uh, making uh, LA look tiny type of cities. What happens to your stable community and your talk about sustainable development? So I just want to bring this from a very visceral and very individual way of looking at infrastructure that uh, modified Maslow, that if you're in a post-disaster environment, you think about, you think like this, you think about how am I going to get my water and sanitation, hygiene, food, air, and then you start to think, okay, now am I secure? Am I going to, am I breathing anything toxic? And then you can start to gather your friends and family, and then at the end of the day, you might be able to start like getting better that day, starting to achieve. And so all these things are very independent or dependent. They're one on top of the other. And then as you go from an individual to a community, every city has built up these systems and subsystems very differently. You build up these resilient systems that might look completely different than what we do in Redlands or Denver, Colorado. But I want to look at this in terms of time spent because it's these differences that we have to use in terms of judgment for design. That in post-disaster, in formal slums, formal slums, poor rural, this is pretty much true. You spend a lot of time worrying about getting your food and water and security um, before you can start to think about achievement and higher thoughts. Then think about us today. So I'm just flipping this over, but I stayed at the Ayers Hotel. I didn't worry about the water. I checked in with my family by a text message, all okay, yeah, all okay. Um, I was ready to achieve at 8 a.m. Okay, I have all day to achieve. And I just flip this around, so it's not to imply that we're more moral. Uh, we have a lot more time on our hands, and how we used to spend that might be um, reality TV. I don't know. It's up to you to, to achieve or to not. But currently, developing countries, which is a majority of the global population, might look at it like this that even highly educated, highly uh, technical communities um, still have this chronic day-to-day -day stress. It's a psychological stress of dealing with basic infrastructure. And this is creating a brain drain from developing countries, not because of economic opportunities. They can live very well in developing countries, but it's this chronic day-to-day -day stress that you have to think about. So these communities and, and different cities are different paradigms. And I agree with this, that how can you be a systems thinker if you don't know what paradigm you're working in? And I don't, engineers don't generally talk about paradigms of infrastructure, so I've created some. <laughs> so I have, a, I have a slide for every one of the seven sectors of infrastructure, but I'm just gonna show one, and it's water, as a way of thinking about it, that uh, in Denver or Redlands, we have comprehensive infrastructure. I can go to the water fountain, drink it, and I'm sure I'm not gonna die, okay? Um, that's a lot of trust 
in capacity of the government or the utility. In a lot of countries, you have what I call failed infrastructure, where by GIS, it looks like you have a water treatment plant, water mains, distribution, taps. It looks exactly the same, but you grow up as a kid where your mother says, don't ever drink water from the tap, it'll kill you. So there's a complete different way of looking at infrastructure in most of the world. And so how you deal with this is either you treat it again in your home with RO, UV, ceramic candles, or you buy imported water. So the whole municipal water supply is circumvented by buying because you don't trust it. Then you also have disconnected, so the informal slums, uh, poor rural, that have tap stands or tanker trucks. So very different paradigms, and that's just for water. So to pick on water one more time with this ISO one, uh, 37120, this is a great metric, you know, uh, percentage of the city with potable water supply. I have no arguments with that. But read on, and it says potable water through a pipe that is connected to a network, the supply of which is relatively continuous. There is no such thing as relatively continuous. Either it's continuous or it's not. <laughs> Two different, you're jumping paradigms by throwing in that one word. If they just tick out relatively, then, then you're in one paradigm. What does relatively continuous look like on the UN urbanization report? Um, this is not a high resolution, so bear with me. I just, you know, paint shop this one. Um, but what do you see? This is low income housing. Um, but what you see is a water tank on every single house. So when it's relatively continuous, when the water does come, you fill up your tank. And then when the tank gets there, you have to treat it again. This is not a phenomenon for socioeconomic lower strata. This is upper strata. Everybody in the developing country, that if you're connected to a system, you have, you have a water tank. Why is it a completely different system? Because we have treat, distribute, drink. There they have treat, distribute, store, treat, then drink. There's a lot of money that's being used and a lot of energy that's used across households in India when you start to add up tens of millions of households that are all using uh, retreating water. Why does it get contaminated? Because pressurized pipes are very hard to contaminate. Once you unpressurize a pipe, it's very easy to contaminate by groundwater and sewage and whatever. Then if, it's, if you have to store it, it's also easy to contaminate by airborne and insect. So the water is treated, distributed, and contaminated and treated again. It's a completely different paradigm. Or if you don't have a tap, it's distributed, and then you have unsanitary containers. So this is a con purposely blurry photo of a megacity in the developing world. And the point is, how do you look at it? So you can look at it as the structure downtown where you wear a suit and tie and you're an engineer and you talk about just, you know, putting in a water system where the reality is nobody drinks that water. And if you change it around, will they? After decades of decades of never drinking water out of the tap. So it's failed comprehensive. How do you look at the slums or the disconnected areas? Is this the world of NGOs and humanitarian engineers and we're not gonna worry about that? Or can you look at both of them as like, nobody is drinking the water directly out of the tap. There's a lot of appropriate technology, ceramic filters, um, pure water pack. There's a lot of things that are common across socioeconomic strata in this design. Okay, so it's this kind of background that um, 2005 to 2007 um, is a good example that I worked on the Kigali uh, conceptual master plan. Um, Doing a conceptual master plan is very unique because it's not a project, right? It's looking at the entire region. So it allows you to look at a city a little bit differently. And Danella also uses this, the ability to self-organize is the strongest form of system resilience. And I agree because even though there's death and disease, I mean, it's not um, nice everywhere, but uh, there's seven billion people that are figuring out every single day. And over decades and generations, they've developed systems. You can't just say this system is not good. There's expectations that go along with how you get things or how much it costs and, and who gets what. And this has been developed for a long time. So I won't uh, go through the graphics too much, but if you start to look at a city as all the systems, not just like water system, but you see water as a subsystem of infrastructure, which is another subsystem, you start to say like, these projects, if you work on a project and you call it a sustainable project, 
I look at it as like a city DNA strand. That one, one element, one project in that sub-subsystem does not make a sustainable city. So the unique thing about a master plan is able to step back and look at the entire city. And this is actually a discussion for resiliency. I look at projects as weak links in a city. But the point from this is, um, can you look at the entire city and really think about the long-term constraints of a city in a region? And for us in Rwanda, we looked at primarily resources and social constraints. And so you all know where Rwanda is. It's Eastern Africa, right off the equator. Um, but look again in terms of location, landlocked, no fossil fuel. Um, the refineries are Dar es Salaam and Mobasa on the coast. The red are roads. The black are railroad. So if you're saying there's no fossil fuel, okay, you're gonna have to commute 500 miles over treacherous roads with your fossil fuel, and that's what they do. What do they have? Wind is not very good. It's a land of a thousand hills, no great plains. It's a land of gorillas in the mist. Solar is not very good. <laughs> and so you start to like slowly panic as an engineer as you're getting closer and closer to make these presentations about like long-term plans for infrastructure. So getting into that, what I want to present in the last section here are just how we took these constraints and, and translated them across all the sectors of infrastructure. And I'm just briefly going into it. Each one of these is a kind of a different presentation. But you can see I'm looking at energy and social constraints when we're looking at stormwater and municipal solid waste for real briefly on these slides. So my panic, and this is, I guess uncertainty is the other word, um, this is my one GIS slide, I guess, as close as I could get. <laughs> but this is at 3, 3 a.m. in my hotel room, and all I had was a map of Kigali, worrying about, like, putting in, do you, do you put in lift stations and 450 horsepower pumps and that's focus on diesel fuel? Or do you come up with something that's really innovative for Kigali in the long term? And so for me that night, I just, I drew a map and I had uh, highlighters and a pen and came up with 26 watersheds. They said a land of a thousand hills, they don't have fossil fuel, but they have gravity. And so, you know, I always get this eye roll from my colleagues the first time, <laughs> but uh, gravity is, is uh, pretty predominant in Kigali. So how do you look at this as a lens for all of your infrastructure? And so you can start with uh, the easy one. So this is a, Outline of a typical watershed, you know, highest to lowest, and you know, stormwater. So everybody does stormwater. Um, nothing new, but in developing countries, oftentimes your stormwater has open channel sewers, and so stormwater takes on a different um, role. It also becomes a wastewater engineer. So how do you do wastewater without lifting it to a centralized plant? How can you incorporate all this? And so we started coming up with these um, zones that we call environmental treatment zones, I'll get to that later, with constructed wetlands and, and wetland buffers and energy dissipators. But then also, how do you feed the needs of the, of the wetlands and secondary crops? Um, how do you tie that into the living that's going on with markets and composting? So we started looking at all this, but starting with stormwater and, um, and open sewers. But if you've been to Kigali, it is literally one of the cleanest cities I've ever been to. And the municipal solid waste is not controlled by the government. Um, it's partially funded, but there's two women's genocide survivor groups that primarily do all of it, Sammy and Amy Zero. And over the last um, 20 years, 21 years, um, they've developed a system for how they pick things up, how they recycle. Very minimal is actually then disposed of. So it's very interesting. So this is one of those resilient systems to consider. And so we got into it. Um, for a long time, we interviewed them, how far are they moving, and we saw that the household collectors are transporting waste an average of five kilometers a day. So five kilometers on a bicycle, if it's flat terrain, is one thing. Five kilometers if you're going up and down hills all day long with a load is quite another thing. So we looked at how does gravity impact this. So we designed a system for watersheds to uh, reduce the burden of those vertical gains and collectors to facilitate uh, their work. And again, this is a watershed, highest elevation to lowest elevation. And I'll start from the bottom, but what we, that environmental treatment zone, this is where the compost, the wet organics, the heavy stuff 
kind of flows downhill to our composting. In the middle, the dry organics are brought to a, a processing site that the dry organics can be turned into briquettes, and they are. They're turned into briquettes, and briquettes are, play, are used in lieu of um, charcoal, which is a primary commodity in uh, Kigali. At the end of the day, even construction goods are recycled, and at the end of the day, what is left over can be put on the main collector road, and then that is taken to the municipal solid waste site. So what we're trying to do is use gravity. It's not replacing everything, but it's incorporating this concept of a lens of free energy into all the systems. So material and physical constraints. And this is more the engineering side, um, mixing with the design and planner side. Um, I know this isn't Kigali. This is Nebraska or Iowa or something. But uh, the point is, um, it's asphalt. And designers and planners typically think of road typologies and don't think of the materials or construction of it. Not typically, so I don't, I don't want to offend anybody, but typically it's, it's road widths, access, green space, all this type of stuff. And what I want to point out is how we all have to be on the same page. It's as an engineer, I looked at what is a material. And asphalt is a refinery product. So again, it's coming from Dar es Salaam or Mabasa. Um, when you rip it up, you have to have the infrastructure for recycling it. If you don't have that, it becomes a cradle to grave type of issue. So what can you do? Well, also, how many people are operating uh, an expensive machine? So what can you do? And cobblestones, if you go to Kigali, you see a lot of cobblestone roads. So this is um, damned by some people because <laughs> for reasons, but um, put it, look at all the labor that's going there. So there's that. It's cobblestones, which are local material. Cobblestones will never go away. If you have to pull it up to put in a water main, you simply pull up the rocks. You put them back in. What does it look like? It's much more visibly attractive than asphalt. Tie that back into stormwater management. What does uh, cobblestone roads have over asphalt? It's a higher manning coefficient. It's a rough surface. It's permeable. So all these things are tying in to materials now and energy and flow and social considerations for um, employment. And finally, I'll end with housing. So 80% of Kigali is informal. So meaning 80% of the people, of 800,000 people, I'll just do the math, um, live informally, meaning they are not planned. Okay, and the only building code that we had to go on, this is from 2004, but in 2005 when we started, this is the only building code that buildings have to be durable. And I simply asked, what does that mean? And they said concrete blocks. And this is a whole other issue, but concrete blocks, there's no way you can produce that much. So look at Kigali, what, what exists. This is a typical wattle and daub construction for an outhouse for 10 families. This is a typical sun-dried block, um, block construction for a commode for 30 families. None of this is durable. 800,000 people out of a million are not living in durable conditions. Um, this is another long story, but the, we had to get into low-cost housing, and the Rwandan architect proposed this, that we have a two bedrooms, living room, and then all the water annex, the kitchen, the bucket shower, and the poor flush toilet. And here's a road, and I just simply asked, where's the water coming from? Where's, how, are you, how are you bringing this all together in a land where you get 40, 45 inches of rain per year? So the outcome was we moved the water close with a breezeway to uh, kill breezes, but a common roof. And what that allowed us to do is, let me just jump to that, is provide rainwater harvesting that became part of the building code. So a lot of, a lot of states, even in India, have building codes that incorporate rainwater harvesting, and we're doing the same in Kenya and Africa right now, too. Um, what do you do with a poor flush? What do you do when your pit latrine fills up? You can't move your house. You have to do something other than pit latrines. So we did anaerobic uh, digesters, and this is a model house in Kimisanja. But basically, what we're trying to do is alleviate as much of the infrastructure off-grid as possible to deal with that. And it looks nice. So in a nutshell, how things happen in Rwanda, like plastic bags were outlawed overnight by President Kagame. Uh, the mayor of Kigali came out and loved it. Um, three days later, it was determined to be durable. This is uh, stabilized compressed earth blocks. So things were just moving so fast that eventually what happened is a year later, the, uh, they took the exact same design and built Betsinda, which is 480 um, units. So the whole point here is that, you know, rather than going in as an expert and explaining how things are done, 
if you take kind of a Zen-like approach and just like understand that things are moving and things are socially acceptable, although they're not logical to you, um, a lot of innovation can come out of it. So in conclusion, uh, non sequiturs are just long-held beliefs that impact the expected performance of infrastructure and should be considered for overall project approach. In most countries, constraints are more than economic. Being forced to consider these constraints can lead us to innovation here. And finally, incorporating uh, non sequiturs and constraints requires true interdisciplinary coordination, which is what geodesign is. So with that, I say thank you. Yeah. Great, right on time. Thank you.